European counterparts are being pursued. Uh, one way of gauging uh, changes in expenditure is looking at uh, changes per student uh, year by year. It's 1995. There's a change in expenditure. We know that expenditure is going up in all of these countries. We also know that the number of students are expanding quite rapidly. And here is the uh, uh, student expenditure. And we can see that in some countries it's going up. So in Sweden, Austria, United Kingdom, it's going up. But in many countries, it's actually going down. Uh, in Ireland, Spain, even in the United States, the expenditure is going down in 1995 per student. Now let's look at the same figure in 2006, nine years later. Uh, again, the expenditure is going up in all countries number of students going up in all countries, and the per student expenditure going up in almost every country with the possible exception of Norway and Iceland and Germany and the Netherlands. All other countries per student expenditures are going up. So what this represents uh, is uh, massive uh, inflows of dollars. Now these uh, expenditures and expenditures per student are not uh, only from public expenditures. In many cases, they're from private expenditures. It includes both. And countries differ rather dramatically as to whether the source of the, of the investment is taxpayers or whether the source of the investment uh, is private. Uh, here's the proportion public. Um, you can see in Korea, for example, about in 2007, uh, let's say 20, 21 percent of the expenditure in higher education is public, which implies uh, almost 19, uh, oh, sorry, about 80 percent of the expenditure in Korea is from private expenditure. The United States um, is uh, uh, behind, you know, very close to Korea, and then you have a country like Germany, uh, 84 percent, uh, in fact, is public. Uh, France, uh, about the same, 84 percent. Now I'm going to explain to you one of the characteristics, you know, this is a preview of what's about to come, one of the characteristics of national policies which are conducive to world-class universities is a diversity of the sources of financing in higher education. The more financing is a monopoly of the government, of taxpayers, the less life you're going to have. Uh, uh, world-class universities. So we're going to look at countries around the world in that uh, way. So here's academic rankings. Uh, now this uh, first ranking from Shanghai uh, was the, it took the world by storm. Uh, they do it every year. Um, uh, you should know that this ranking system, there's several characteristics about this ranking system. Um, it's based on um, objective criteria in the hard sciences only. Uh, it doesn't include the humanities, and it doesn't include the social sciences. Uh, but it includes publication, publication records, uh, income derived from external sources. It even includes numbers of uh, Nobel Prize winners and things like that, which I'm not suggesting that it's the best ranking system. I'm simply reporting to you that this is one of the most well known. Here are the top uh, 25 of the top 100 universities. Uh, uh, your friend and mine, Harvard, uh, being number one. Uh, is number two? Stanford, or I gave them. Uh, University of Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> I hate these guys. Uh, they're all there. Um, but let's face it, they are, uh, about all ostensibly, um, um, uh, criteria, certain universities. Now the question is, how are these distributed, the first 100, around the world? And here's a ranking by country from the Shanghai rankings. The United States, out of the top 100, the United States had garnered uh, 52 of the top 100 universities. The United Kingdom, uh, 8. Germany, 8. Japan, 5, etc. On down to Russia, Israel, Austria, Denmark, Finland, and Italy, one each. Um, and then you get some top rank. So this suggests that uh, by this uh, ranking, by the way, I think one other characteristic of this uh, Shanghai ranking 
is interesting to me is that um, there's no Chinese university which appears in the top 100 universities by their own ranking, uh, which to me is a, it's very interesting politically in China as to this, they're portraying this as a uh, criterion of excellence and from China, and yet there is no Chinese university by their ranking, which is in the top of the country, which is a, a wake-up bell. It's kind of a message uh, of sorts. Um, you may disagree with their criteria for how they rank, which we can discuss, uh, but uh, as a political message to the Chinese government, among others, uh, it's rather important. Now, there's all kinds of ways to rank the university. Uh, there's the U.S. News and World Report. There's something called the Washington Monthly. There's Forbes <coughs> Magazine. There's the Times Higher Education Supplement. And I've given you here the, the uh, measures that they use. And you can see by the complexity of these lines is that um, they don't all use the same measures. Some of their measures are, are uh, empirical in the sense that and, and neutral, like numbers of publications. Some of them rank those publications in terms of impact of the journals. Uh, some of them use, like the U.S. News and World Report, uses um, prestige rankings on the basis of opinions of people in the field. So there's a, 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 a questionnaire to doctors in the United States. <coughs> Would you please rank American medical schools? So they, by their opinion, they say, it's like you ranking your, your favorite, I don't know, pizza <laughs> or your favorite automobile. Uh, is, that, uh, uh, is that an accurate uh, assessment or not? But it is one of the ways in which uh, ranking systems uh, do work. Um, the question is, what is, what is it about the United States that seems to pay off? Um, by the way, I see many of you taking notes I'm sure we can distribute this PowerPoint presentation to everybody who wants it. So uh, you have it. And so maybe if you if you put in your email and give it to Dr. Lennon, he'll send it out to you. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so you don't have to busily, you know, <laughs> I see you. But I'm pleased, I'm honored that you want to write everything down. But you know, let's be efficient enough that you can get it in your inbox tomorrow. Um, among the characteristics of the United States, which, which seems, in my opinion, to, to make an awful lot of difference, is a diversity. It's a quite diverse system. In fact, I don't speak of the United States as having a single system of higher education. I use plural, systems, plural. There's a diversity in price. And most importantly, there's a diversity in function. So different universities at different higher education institutions have different missions, they have different purposes. Uh, in France and Germany, they all have the same purpose. In the United States, the, a teaching college, a liberal arts college, a research university, a community college, they all have different purposes. So they're judged on different performance criteria. And they have different qualities. For some reason, Americans, now Canadians, and to a large extent now, Brits and Australians and New Zealanders, to a less extent, people from the Netherlands and other Nordic countries, are learning to differentiate the quality of higher education experience by price. Just as you would say, okay, um, you have, you want to buy the best car, and you have uh, $50,000 to spend on a car. And you, uh, so if you buy, you know, a Ford at fifteen thousand dollars, or a Volkswagen at thirty thousand dollars, or a BMW at fifty thousand dollars, you are buying a different automobile. You all know that. So you have the University of Pennsylvania at a very high price, and you have a community college probably here in Philadelphia at a very low price, and you can take a course called Introduction to Economics or statistics or anthropology at both institutions. But the price for the same course is very different. So Americans are used to this phenomenon. But this is not a universal phenomenon in higher education. And actually, is quite 
you, I wouldn't say unique, but it's quite characteristic of some parts of the world and not characteristic of others. High access. So what I mean by access in this instance is very high rates of attendance at some form of higher education. So that uh, it, so the selection at the end of secondary school is not whether you go to higher education or not. That's not the issue. Not really. It's which kind of higher education you're going to get into. It's whether you get into the University of Chicago or the University of Illinois. That makes a difference. But if you want to go to university in the United States, you can go. Cost is not the major uh, issue. Um, and high flexibility. You would be amazed at how inflexible university systems are in most parts of the world. Very difficult to transfer from program X to program Y. And often in Jordan, in Germany, in Austria, uh, where else? Uh, Turkey, the secondary school test that you take to enter a university not only assigns you to which institution you are forced to enter, but which program. So in Jordan, for example, if you don't get into medical school, you, you're assigned to zoology, whether you're interested in zoology or not. So the dropout rates, the level of dissatisfaction among students in these kinds of systems are, is very high. And why is that? Because surveys show that the majority of them don't want to be in the programs in which they are enrolled. Here they are adults in higher education, and the majority are not in the programs. Well, what do you do if you are in the United States and you're in a program to which you don't like? What do you do? <laughs> Credits transfer. Now, Europe is just beginning to initiate a program of credit transfer, just now. And they're doing it all wrong, but that's another story. So, <laughs> so there are some characteristics of this system which are conducive to this flexibility, high access, and wide diversity. So here's some illustrations of uh, diversity in price. Uh, now, these uh, can be true of Canada as well, uh, but you can range from a two-year college at $10,000 or a, a, a high uh, uh, public university or a private research university such as your own. It can be four or even five times the price. So you can take introduction to physics at a community college with credits that can transfer to a four-year college. Uh, at 20% uh, the price. That's diversity. Um, now, here are some characteristics of the American higher education. There are 5,000, over 5,000 types of institutions, individual institutions. What many people don't know is that the majority of them, 80%, are not selected. They take you if you can pay the price. If you graduate from secondary school, you can get in. So 80% of the higher education system, when we think of Higher education in the United States, we think of Harvard. You know, okay, well, really tough to get into Harvard. But 80% of all the system, the only institutions out there are not Harvard. Uh, they are not selected. Research institutions like your own, like mine, less than 5%. So 80% are non-selected. Uh, there's two-year colleges, uh, some public and some private, the liberal arts colleges. <coughs> teaching universities and research universities. 93 university, uh, universities and research universities are private and about 165 are public. For example, the University of Texas at Austin, University of California, Berkeley, UCLA. These are public, Michigan State, University of Michigan, uh, University of Tennessee. These are research universities, but that are public. So when we think of higher education in the United States, if you think of the systems, Think of this diversity, price, and function, and purpose. Now here's an example. The community college in my local community is called Volunteer State uh, Community College. It has 8,000 students, 750 faculty, has a budget of 7 million, has 70 different programs in humanities, social sciences. This is a major um, conduit into the workforce. 
44% of the students that are there are there in order to transfer to a four-year college. Now think about it. You know what the criteria to get in to, to um, volunteer state, you know what the criteria is? Sign your name. You don't even have to speak English. We'll take you off the airplane. And you don't have to speak English. Come in. And the first introductory courses is how to speak English. <laughs> then the next, they teach you how to write. Then they teach you how to do academic writing before you take an academic course. And then if you're good enough, then they'll, and you know, the cost of that is virtually free. But by the way, it's, it's a modest charge. Modest charge. This is open access. And then you can take physics and chemistry, and if you get a, a B average, you can transfer to the University of Tennessee. How open is that? What other country? Name a country where you can get off the boat without speaking the language, pay a pocket change, and have access to a four-year college such as the University of Tennessee. It's amazing, this system. And so part of the virtue of this system, this heterogeneous system, are these, the 80% that we don't often hear about. Now, here's some examples. Oh, how much are university presidents paid? <laughs> oh, Ohio State. Here's some universities I've never heard of. You've never heard of them. $4.8 million a year. Southern Methodist, 2.8. Vanderbilt. Oh, man. My president is paid $2.4 million a year. Do you know why they're paid so much? What, are they just privileged fat cats, or? <laughs> what do they do? What does a university president do? Yes? They get funds. <laughs> they get funds. It's, it's more than get, they're held accountable for getting funds. I'm going to pay you $2.8 million, and you have a program, like my president has a program, of raising $2 billion. You perform, you get paid. You don't perform, it's good night. It's good pie. And you know why? Because, and who does the president work for? The state government? Does he work, who is, the, who is your president of your university? Who does he work for? Who does he, is there a president? She, 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 she. Lady, lady, sorry. Okay. Who does she work for? Board of Trust. Where does the Board of Trust come from? Is it appointed by the state government of, the, of Pennsylvania? Where does it come from? Doors. <laughs> what? Doors. Okay, it, it, I think it's an independent board of trust. Your university is like a corporation. And the board of trust are this boss. And they hire the chief executive. And if the chief executive performs, she gets paid. And if she doesn't perform, she gets fired. And because of your university, you know, in other words, it's a, even if it's a not for profit, it's not for loss. Okay, it, this is a business. It's not a profit-making business, but it's a business. And, it, and so performance is part of the game. So, and what do you do if you're in a country? Imagine a country, Kazakhstan, where all university presidents are appointed by the Minister of Education, his friends, for a bribe, or Germany. Or France, where university presidents uh, are appointed for political reasons. Wait a minute, and can't be fired. And you talk to a rector of a German university, and he says, I wish I were president of an American university. You know why? Because I want, he thinks, my hands are tied by the regulations that I have to live. I can't raise my own money. If I raise money in many countries, the money doesn't go to the university. It goes to the government, the treasury. So what incentive is there for me to raise money? So the overall regulatory environment is really important for whether you compete, how well you can compete in higher education. So salaries of researchers. Now, here are some comparisons, uh, both in euros and uh, uh, euros with uh, uh, parity pricing. Uh, you'll find this, the researcher salaries are getting pretty close between USA 
Australia, Japan, and Austria. Fairly close. So um, what we're seeing is a kind of consensus about high performance, high pay. In other words, there's a consensus around if you want high performance among researchers, you've got to pay them. You've got to pay them well. Why is that? In part because labor is mobile. We can hire a university uh, professor from Germany. Well, I can hire somebody from France. I can hire somebody from Brazil. There's no, there's an international labor market. You yourselves can go anywhere in the world if you've got talent at this level. So in order to compete, you have to compete in terms of price. Uh, here's some faculty salaries at world class. Here's Rockefeller, Harvard, Stanford. I've given you the uh, Jingtao, uh, the Shanghai ranking uh, from these universities, and then some of their annual salaries of uh, uh, faculty. At, uh, some of the so $185,000 at Harvard uh, is uh, possible. So there is that's that's a lot of money. So uh, at the, these world class universities, salaries are, are high. Um, Here's a how, give you an example of the diversity of income. Here's my own university, 2010. Everybody says, oh, Heinemann, you come from Vanderbilt, your tuition is like the University of Pennsylvania. If your tuition is, let's say, $40,000 a year, so you must be a very rich university. We don't get our money from tuition. It's hard for people to understand it. Can you see how much money we get from tuition and fees, we get about 20% of our income. 80% of our income come from other sources. So, in fact, the tuition that we charge, like you, the tuition we charge, we repurpose. What do we do? We, you know, of the of every <coughs> three students who come to Vanderbilt, one pays full price. Two pay less than full price. And part of their subsidy comes from us. So we repurpose the tuition so, and we charge those who can afford it and we charge less to those who can't afford it. So we want the best and the brightest, just like you do, but we charge high tuition because there are a lot of rich people out there who can afford it. And then we repurpose the tuition and that is how all major. If you look at Harvard, look at your own revenue, you look at uh, Chicago or Duke or Columbia, you're going to see a similar diversity of the sources of revenue. And that includes private gifts and grants, it includes endowments, investment income. We have an endowment of uh, $2.4 billion. What is your endowment here at Penn? You know? You're in a billion. How many? Anybody know? Six billion. Six. Oh, I think six billion. This is, you know, can't change. Six billion. Well, good for a job. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I tell you what. Uh, um, ours, ours about two hundred. We are number uh, sixteen in the world, uh, band, in terms of size of endowment. Harvard is number one, and they're five times bigger than me. So, and, you know, they have over 20 billion. They're 14 billion. How big is Harvard? is about 14, 12 billion. Well, I think it's higher than that. No, I think it's close to 20. Okay. So I think, you know, so, now you look at, you look at your uh, uh, Ajos University in uh, Netherlands, uh, just over one billion dollars. Uh, and Ajos is a rich university. You look at uh, Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they are not big players uh, in terms of American size and down. So, uh, uh, part of the way in which you compete are the fact that you have money that you can use that, know, that you own, that the corporation owns and can invest and allocate. It's just part of the new, new game, competition. Uh, now, here's the University of Tennessee. You say, oh, well, you're a private university. Uh, Public universities are, are constrained, but you look at how much money uh, that the um, state gives to the University of Tennessee. Uh, answer here is about, where are we? 
I, I'm mixing up my blues, but I believe it's about 25%. I think it's the one on the left. A state appropriation. I'm not sure whether it's this one or that one. You think so? All right, we'll, we'll go with that. We'll go with the high figure. But it's a state university. Um, and many people say, well, they get their money from government. About a third of their money comes directly from appropriations from the state government. And that's typical. You look at the university. Uh, of uh, Tennessee or the University of California, or the University of Michigan or Michigan State, the proportion of their annual recurring expenditures, they come, and I mean directly from government, uh, not indirectly, because they compete for a lot of money that is government, that has government origins, but it's about 20% or 25% or even 15%. What's the point here? The point is that public universities and private universities are in the same game. Diversify your resources, uh, generate uh, contracts and grants, generate endowment. Uh, and just because you're a public university doesn't mean that you don't behave very much in similar ways uh, to a major private university. Uh, so here's the European University. Here is, um, uh, in general, here is the the green here is their public funding. So 72, 73% of the money from a typical European university comes from allocations. Now many Europeans will say, oh, this is the way it should be. Universities should be uh, publicly funded. Is it not a public good? What's the answer? Uh, it is a public good. But here's the reality. If you control salaries from the state, then you can't. You want a world-class university, you've got to pay people what they're worth. And if you can't pay them what they're worth, you're not in the competition. So the universities in Europe are very often in this dilemma uh, here that with long traditions of high state appropriations and the regulations which accompany that, meaning faculty salaries are flat and fixed according to civil service salaries. And then we start stealing, and you start stealing them very easily because uh, they don't have the research facilities and because they uh, can't compete uh, internally for the uh, incomes uh, that they can achieve uh, internationally. Here's Aarhus University, a university that I work with rather closely in Denmark. Uh, it's got a very high uh, endowment, um, a lot of money coming from competitive research funding uh, uh, in endowment of it's about close to 1 billion US dollars, 500 million euros, uh, 8,500 8, staff, uh, 35,000 students. It's ranked 93 in the Shanghai and 81 in the Times Higher Education Supplement Rankings. Here's a university that is, that if you, if you were to be lifted with a parachute down to Ajos University, you'd be very comfortable there. It looks like Penn. I mean, it, it has the modern, all the classrooms are up to date. Their university professors are highly competitive, uh, and they have the ability to pay them uh, what they were. This is Denmark. Here's some China. Uh, here is uh, institutions such as Beijing University, and this is the proportion of funding that comes from non-government sources. So you'll see that China has uh, quickly adapted uh, to this competition of diversifying of uh, sources of money to run uh, universities. Um, oops. I'm missing a slide here. Oh, I see. I just can't see it up here. Um, you can see it up there. You can see it here. Uh, part of our problem has to do with what we call public and what we call private. Uh, there are six characteristics uh, which you need to use to define public and private. Their mission, their ownership, their sources of revenue, their control over their own fiscal affairs, faculty control, and management control. And you can find some universities where they're high, high on one and low on the other. So whenever you say public and private, got to be a little bit more specific in terms of these more uh, specific characteristics. 
Um, here are uh, financial autonomy of European public universities. Uh, low financial autonomy, medium financial autonomy, and high financial. As you can see in 1995, 12 uh, countries were classified as high financial autonomy in 1995. In 2008, uh, only about 13 years later, that went up to 14. Low financial autonomy changed from 12 down to 4. So what I'm trying to try and suggest to you is that there's a worldwide movement toward financial autonomy. A worldwide movement toward many of these characteristics which you associate with the United States, but they're not necessarily American anymore, but global. Um, here's a ranking of professional schools and law and education. Oh, look at that. My goodness, education. How did that happen? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry I put that there. Vanderbilt's number one. Oh, jeez, I'm going to start. How that got in there, I'm just... Now, it's really, you know, when every time I'm ranking, like if you're number one, you can say, oh, they're not making dirt. But that's good, you know, you can be real, you're real generous with you. Um, how did it get there? Oh, look, here's a, here's a list of, of, um, of, of uh, departments in my university that have been responsible for competing for outside resources, both government and private resources. Number one, electrical engineering, which in 2008 brought in 24 million, 700. Look at number two, my department, leadership, policy, and organizations. We brought in 24 million dollars, my department, that year. Oh, look at number three, special education, uh, 14 million. This is by part, teaching and learning, number nine. These are highly, in other words, and what is the reason why they do this? I mean, you, you compete for outside money. Don't think that you just get the money and go to sleep. You get the money and work like crazy. It means you work like crazy. Now, how much money did Heinemann bring in? Zero. But you know what? When my colleagues win, like Tom Smith just won a $12 million grant from the Institute of Education Sciences, I thank you, Tom. You know why? Because the money is split three ways. He keeps part of it, of course, there's a project. His salary, of course, is affected by that. My department, the income from my department goes up. Thank you very much. I get new carpeting, new computers. I have a new tech assistant. Whenever something goes wrong, Heinemann calls help because I'm an old guy and don't know much about computers, and I get excellent advice. Thank you, Tom Smith. And part goes to my dean, and part goes to the provost. So everybody wins. Okay. Now, if you don't have a governance structure like that, not the incentive to garner outside resources is going to be different. And a lot of universities, it doesn't go to you. It goes to the provost office. So part of the competition is how you manage the success. So here are the implications. Large pool of first-rate industry institutions in the United States, multiple choices of institutional missions, high amount of institutional movement up and down, just because, you know, University of Texas at Austin, Stanford University. When I was a kid, Stanford University was it was a finishing school. Yeah, it was. It was no. It was nothing. In 1950, it was it was unheard of. But by 1960, by 1980, so there's a lot of movement up and down. These things are not permanent. High degree of transfer. High prestige local and state institutions. Low dependence on tuition at research universities. Low dependence on curriculum-based entry examination. Another thing, the, the use of a national test, particularly, uh, and I know nobody likes the SAT, but the SAT has virtues. Among the virtues is that it's not curriculum-based. It's not. It is aptitude kind. But the reason why it was invented was that it gave a kid from Fishtail, Montana, a way of competing with a kid from Scarsdale, who the kid from Montana 
goes to a very poor school district. He doesn't have the facilities in chemistry. China can learn something from the SAT, where rural kids in China are systematically discriminated against in terms of their chances of getting into universities by reason of geography, by reason of accident of where they are born. The SAT helped the United States in the highest system get around that problem. Now, here are the characteristics of world-class universities. I am taking this, this isn't Heinemann, this is Jamil Salvi at the World Bank, so I'm taking it from his publication. And this is the state of what we know about this, is that high concentration of talent, abundant resources, and enabling governance within the university. All of these are in the policy paper, uh, not policy, but the research paper published by Jamil Salmi uh, from the World Bank. Now we go into new territory. And what I'm trying, to, the next few minutes, I'm going to suggest to you that these characteristics uh, require an enabling environment from outside leaders in terms of rules and regulations of the nation at large. And uh, here are the sector requirements that I will, suge I will suggest to you that there are about 10 of them. There has to be a high degree of non-state income. In other words, uh, Moscow State and Leningrad State and Tbilisi State, uh, with, if they have uh, non-state income, <clears throat> they get penalized in terms of their taxes. They have to pay corporate income taxes, just as if they were a steel mill or, or manufacturing shirts. So there's no uh, dispensation for educational institutions. So they have to have a wide diversity of income, uh, and they have to have a wide differentiation. All university systems can be divided into three categories. There are unitary systems, like Italy, where all universities in the entire country are they're expected to perform exactly the same function. There are binary systems, like France, where most universities are expected to perform the same function, but they have some technological universities or technical universities for specialized subjects. And then there are diversified systems. Canada, United States, New Zealand, Australia, Japan, Korea, where there's a wide variety of missions, a very divergent uh, missions. Uh, there's institutional autonomy, and I mean real autonomy, in governance, like in your institution, in finance, in management. And can you believe that, in, uh, that universities in Kazakhstan cannot teach uh, subjects that the government doesn't allow them to teach? They have to get clearance from a government agency if they want to open up a new subject. Even in Germany, the state institutions in Germany have to have permission from the state uh, agency to open up a new subject. So this, so this uh, clearance, five minutes, okay, we're getting, uh, the legal environment, the university has to own property. We're going to take a moment on that. Many state universities in the world um, do not own their own property. The, go the government owns the property. And so I'll make a a university that does not own its own property cannot compete. It can never be a world-class university. Why is that? Well, in order, to, in order to compete, they need money. If they have to depend on the taxpayer, on the legislature, or on the Ministry of Education, that one source of money, now, how many other priorities does the government have? And if it's a democracy, those priorities about education can go up and down. So it, to be, to be uh, you're like a cork on an open ocean. But every university needs to plan, strategically plan for their own development, including building a new building, building a medical school if they want to. And where do they get the money to do that? Answer, they borrow it. They borrow it from banks. And what do banks use as collateral? Answer, land. If you, can't, if you don't own your own land, you can't borrow. If you can't borrow, you can't build. And if you can't build, you can never compete as a world-class university. So getting the land transferred to the board of trust is a big, big deal around the world. 
Open competition for state research, significant state and private incentives to improve quality, and autonomous agencies for uh, accreditation uh, and licensing. I'll go into each one of these uh, if you have questions, but I'm going to cut this short. Here is an assessment in the United States, Britain, Germany, and France over how ownership and budget control and tuition and credit transfer in terms of higher education, curriculum control, faculty control, campus administration, again. Now the heart of the matter is here's our grade. We have analyzed the higher education sector in Denmark, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Korea, Canada, Japan, the United States, and we have given them a grade on the degree to which they have policies conducive to the uh, prosperity of world-class universities. And the grades at the end, we have treated all characteristics as equal. We have added them up. We have not given weights, different weights, to one characteristic or another. Uh, and we have given them a total. So they range from France with a low of 18 to Canada or the United States with a very high grade in terms of the policies that are necessary to develop world-class uh, universities. Um, I think this uh, has ramifications for many countries, including China, for example. Uh, and the general implications, you see all nations, every nation in the world, they want their universities to support a competitive economy. All nations want greater access, equity, and equality. But no nation can attain these by utilizing only public tax resources. So it's a competition now to diversify resources, improve efficiency, generate more private resources, and retrench low priority programs. There's only one successful model of a world class university, and that's a university which succeeds in helping to finance its own objectives and is autonomous from government, including public universities. The U.S. and private higher education has traditionally been a leader. All nations have to respond to the very same set of dilemmas and challenges. There will be many rivals to the United States in higher education in the future. And I believe, in my belief, this competition is beneficial for higher education and for the public.